Okay, we're back. We're live. It's a nine o'clock block on a given Wednesday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and more specifically, this is Community Matters with Steve Alm. He's a candidate for prosecuting attorney for the city and county of Honolulu. Good morning, Steve. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, good morning, Jay. Good to be here. So to follow our discussion before we began, you know, um, I feel this is a very important office, uh, and I feel that it has a lot to do with our future, especially under the pressure of COVID. Um, and, um, and, you know, the, 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 the diminution of our economy and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, you, you bring, you find yourself uh, with baggage from the KLO scandal and maybe in the prosecutor's office itself. I mean, there's so many challenges. There's so much baggage to deal with. Why in the world do you want this office? You know? <laughs> well, my wife and I both started there. So we care about the people, we care about the institution, we know how important it is. So I do feel a sense of obligation, you know, to go back, clean it up, train the deputies, bring in some good people, and maybe make it the best office it's ever been. Oh, wow. How do you how do, you do that? I mean, what, what, what specifically is, um, you know, lacking now? And how do you fix that? Okay, well, I think uh, the election really is all about restoring trust to that office. That's what people tell me all around the island when I go talking. Uh, and and I, I, I first wanna thank all the voters in the primary because I was gratified and humbled with that result. I won uh, all the districts island wide from Waianae to you know, Hawaii Kai, from Pearl City to Kaneohe. And I think it, it reinforces that they want a proven leader to get back in there, straighten it out, and get things back to the way they ought to be. So there are many things that need to be done. I think you have to make sure you go in and create a culture of high ethical standards, uh, essentially of doing justice, not just winning cases. It means training the deputy prosecutors so they are as ethical as can be and as skilled as they can be. So you can negotiate plea agreements from strength, you can win more cases. Uh, we have to certainly look at anything Kathy Kealoha had done, uh, any of the cases she touched, make sure there's nothing wrong there. If it is, we'll take appropriate action up to and including dismissing cases. Uh, it, it, it means being a full partner with all the other law enforcement entities. Uh, you know, the attorney general, the U.S. attorney working closely with HPD because they're your main partner in, in doing so many things. Uh, and they all have to be done at the same time. But it also means bringing in good supervisors, you know, who have a good moral compass. You don't want to micromanage people, so you want to hire good people mm -hmm. and uh, have them do their jobs. And I think I have a good uh, history of uh, getting good supervisors under me. Because I've done this before. When I was at the prosecutor's office before, I was first a felony team captain. You know, and you always get offers to go into private practice and civil and make more money or become a criminal defense attorney, make more money. But I, I was committed to that, uh, you know, to the prosecutor's office. And so I was a felony team captain. Then I was head of district and family court where the deputies first joined the office. So I had Loretta Sheehan. I had Ron, now Judge Johnson, Tom Brady, Kevin Takata helped. You know, we made it into a trials division. And I had the deputies in their suits at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning after being in court all week over in district court to learn how to pick a jury, how to do opening statements, how to do direct exam, cross exam. You know what it takes. You don't learn that stuff in law school. You've got to actually learn it on the job. And we did it together. So it'll... You know, my parents taught Rob, my older brother, Robbie, and me to be respectful of everybody, be, you know, courteous to everybody, but also that nobody gets anything done by themselves, right? It's, mm -hmm. It takes a team. It takes a group. Has, has the, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I don't know about how it is now or, or even, um, you know, in, in view of the Kathy and Kealoha issue, uh, has, has the uh, prosecutor's office ever gone political? I mean, has it ever been, you know, politicized in your recollection? No, I mean, it's, uh, it, it was very strong from a trial attorney standpoint when I first joined it, back when Charles Marsland was prosecutor. Mm, I remember. But the focus there was going after organized crime, 
and he had a personal reason with his son, and that was important. Uh, but I think what 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 I can bring to it is when I was U.S. Attorney, I made getting the federal agencies working together and then working with the Honolulu Police Department my number one goal, because they each bring something to the table, whether it's expertise, wiretap capability, maybe certain funding. But HPD is on the street every day. They've got the snitches. People trust them. They pass them information. It was horrible to see the criminal investigative unit get dragged through the mud, you know, with Kealoa, because when I was U.S. attorney, they were a great group. And that's, you know, how we got started investigating Gary Rodriguez, the head of the United Public Workers, because somebody from that unit called us up and said, hey, I've got some information. I want to pass it on to you. And and help you hear about it. And because they trusted us to do the job, take the time to do a good investigation and keep our mouths shut. And it took three years to do that investigation. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, speaking of uh, organized crime for a moment, you know, the, the Miski case um, has really disturbed a lot of people. I can tell you it's disturbed me. I always felt that whatever Hawaii was, it wasn't that. Um, and we've had other incidents of that. I felt uh, named Rothman years ago, and, and uh, you know there are people who you know could be characterized as organized crime. Oh yeah. But Misky murder for hire—that's very, very troubling. And I wonder what your reaction is to that, you know, to the extent that you can speak about it. Right. Uh, what is your reaction to that? Are you as offended as I am by it? What can be done about it? We can't tolerate that in this community. Absolutely. And there have been organized crime. Uh, cases before. Uh, certainly when, you know, Marsland was active then, you had different ethnic groups running different organized crime groups. Uh, and when I was U.S. attorney, there was organized crime running gambling, and gambling was often at the heart of this, right? Down in mm -hmm. Chinatown, mm -hmm. we did lots of cases, 32 defendants that way. And then sooner after I left, uh, uh, Tom Brady was the lead attorney in that poly golf course shooting that was very violent was, you know, was murder there, but it was fighting for control of gambling sec security operations. So what, like you said, what's been publicly reported in Miski is disturbing in the Miski case because it's been going on for a long time. And again, these kind of cases take years to investigate because usually law enforcement hears about it when it's been an ongoing operation. That's how you find out about it. And then you go back in time historically to see what you can put together, dots you can connect. Are there wiretaps you can do? Are there people, you know, who have been charged with other crimes who might want to be turning government witnesses? Uh, but it takes that kind of thing. And the, the federal uh, prosecutors and the, and the Honolulu prosecutors shouldn't be doing the same cases in, you know, in most, most of the time. And it's not efficient. No, it's not. It, and, and the Fed should be taking their time, looking at things, you know, organizations, things like that, not individual cases, unless it's in the service of that kind of thing. And, but then getting the Feds and HPD, because I don't know anything more than you do about MISCI, but I guarantee you HPD has been involved in investigating. Uh, they're looking back at records. They're you know, the feds are very good about making a paper trail in any case, because as you know, in court, often witnesses either know somebody on one side or the other. Jurors are often going to, you know, take any testimony with a grain of salt. But if you have paper showing it, it's like the, the paper cases, bank fraud and stuff against the KLO is, you know, are slam dunk because it's hard to fight a piece of paper. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah, true. It is hard to fight a piece of paper. And Moving from that to the issue of whether, um, you know, we have, we have physical crimes, we have classical criminal activity covered by criminal statutes and all that. Uh, and then we have mm, uh, white collar crimes, which are not classical crimes. And they're not property crimes directly. They're not physical force crimes. They're not, you know, the classical felonies. And, and I wonder how you feel about that. What's more important? I mean, in a way, that kind of that kind of white collar crime is corruption, and it's at the core of our business community, and it, it has a very uh, negative effect on on, on the uh, confidence of the people in the government to let it go on that everybody can cheat. So, what are your thoughts yeah. about which one is more important? 
they're both important. And, but like you say, uh, it, it often gets treated not quite as seriously. So when I was the U.S. attorney, I liked the fact that the federal guidelines had white collar criminals going to prison as well. And I think in, in the state system, the judges have tremendous discretion about prison or probation, you know, in or out, that kind of thing. And, and often uh, the white collar criminals, I think, do, do get a, a treated more leniently that way. When I was a judge, there were all these campaign spending violations. And I would typically, you know, put um, engineers or lawyers into jail for like 10 years, 10, 10 days for this. And I was accused of being Attila the Hun with this, you know, because no, none of the other judges send anybody to jail. And, and for, they said, well, this, this has been going on for a long time. It's like, yeah, you didn't invent this, but you kept this corrupt system going. And so when you read reports about, you know, even allegations about the postmaster had employees make donations and then get bonuses, that was exactly what the, we had cases here all about. You know, so the corporation would, would pay people back if they would donate money. And it's the same kind of thing. And, uh, you know, uh, it's important because white collar crime, political corruption, unlike violent crime, I think you really can deter it. Because nobody thinks about what the penalty will be before they hit somebody over the head with a bottle in a bar, right? Or, or attack somebody in the street. But if they're looking at, at cheating on the system, whether it's campaign donations, uh, other white collar fraud schemes, they are thinking through this. Uh, and that's why when I was US attorney and then when I was a judge, I would treat those cases very seriously. As a judge, there was a guy named Tim Janis, who was a disbarred lawyer and CPA. He had been convicted in federal court on the mainland of ripping off elderly uh, clients. He came here and at the time, the Salvation Army didn't do a background check for that kind of crime. They did it for people working with little kids. Well, he got placed in charge of planned giving. And so he did the same scams here. And when he came in front of me and he was convicted, I gave him 30 years in prison. And I said, I hope, you, I hope you've ripped off your last senior citizen. Because there are people that are preying on other people and they're not the most common ones, but when you catch them, you want to really hammer them. And part of that is to protect other people for the future. But part of that also is anybody thinking about doing that should realize if they get caught, there's going to be, you know, a real price to pay. Yeah, speaking of citizens, <clears throat> senior citizens, uh, I've seen a number of articles about how in, in the time of COVID, in the time of vulnerable senior citizens who can't fight back so easily, uh, they, become, uh, they become targets. And uh, a lot of people, you know, do purse stealing and the like. Um, are they the people who attack senior citizens? Are they entitled to special consideration in sentencing because their victim was a senior citizen? Well, right now, the, the, there's already built into the law that if the person is older, the sentence can be stronger. I don't, you know, I have resisted people asking, how about sentences, you know, make it against tourists, make it higher. And I've resisted that you know, kind of thing. Every, every case is important. Uh, some people, you know, won't remember it, but when I was U.S. attorney, we had a purse snatching uh, thing that was going on for a couple of years. There were hundreds of victims. All Japanese tourists were being targeted. And it got so bad, the Consul General sent an open letter to the mayor saying, if this doesn't stop, I'm going to tell the Japanese tourists not to visit Hawaii anymore. You know, and Hawaii, COVID aside, Hawaii tourism without Japanese tourists would be a disaster. Yeah. But again, it was working. The U.S. Attorney's Office, FBI, HPD, HPD had, a, had done a lot of investigative work. Uh, and we ended up getting the whole ring. I don't remember the star advertiser doing another editorial saying, in this case, we approve of harsh sentences because of the damage they caused. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, literally, it was thousands of cars stolen because they parked one at Kapilani Park and then cruised to Waikiki. A guy would reach out of the rear window and grab onto a woman's purse and drag her until she let go of it. Pelvises were broken. Uh, it was violent stuff. Uh, and it, it didn't care. They just didn't care about people. And so it was very fortunate. John Payton was the lead on, uh, on working with that. And the ringleader pled guilty. And he you know, caved, and then everybody else did too. It, 
Uh, and I think people will take advantage of it now. But, you know, one thing uh, as a judge, and if I become the next prosecutor, I'm the rare criminal justice person who looks at data and research to drive criminal justice policy. Because for too long, it's been anecdote, it's been <laughs> gut feeling, it's been we've always done it this way. You know, there's a better way to do things. So I actually uh, looked at the numbers from HPD. And in the last year, crime is down. It's actually down. I think it's because people are staying home some. There have been some horrendous examples. And if you're the one getting your purse stolen or you're the one getting assaulted, you're not going to feel like crime is down at all. And I completely get that. But in this day of 24-7, uh, you know, cable news and people looking at it, they get phone uh, notifications when there's a crime. I think it can make, if you ask the average person in the street, is crime higher now than it was 10 years ago? I would bet you 90% will say it is. And crime has been dropping for the last 30 years. That's interesting. The yeah, there's certain neighborhoods, of course, that are going to be higher. But if you look island wide or statewide, no question about it, whether it's violent crime, whether it's property crime, it has been dropping for 30 years. You know, you, you, you talk about um, public policy. And it strikes me just in this conversation that um, either de facto or de jure, uh, a, a prosecuting attorney does have um, a hand, if you will, in public policy. Because you can make choices about what you prosecute and what you don't. Um, you, can make, uh, you can examine data about things that are troubling in the community and, and then um, come up with solutions to deal yeah. with the things that bother you. So can, can you comment on that for a minute, Steve, and um, tell us, you know, what, what your thought is about public policy and what your thought is about lobbying. Peter Carlisle used to go to the legislature every year seeking changes to tune up the power of the prosecuting attorney. And in, in many ways, he was successful. But what, what are your thoughts about public well, policy and the job? I think it's very important. And I think people expect it. And I've been in the system for a long time. And uh, you know, my opponents in this kind of race have tried to say, say, oh, he's part of the old system. It's like I have been uh, against the status quo and trying to improve it from day one uh, in any job I've had, whether it was training at deputies or HPD at the prosecutors, whether it was doing weed and seed. And if I get in, we're going to do that again, starting in Chinatown and Kali Palama. We reduce crime by 70 percent there, seven zero. Uh, and that changed the character of both neighborhoods. Back before that, local people were afraid to park their cars there and walk around in Chinatown. It was too dangerous. Now, unfortunately, it slipped back somewhat, but we will get it straightened out again. But the prosecutor, either the Honolulu prosecutor by themselves or working together with the neighbor island prosecutor and the attorney general have a law enforcement coalition where they can take a package of bills up. And that changes, uh, you know, you can help victims, you can uh, make, uh, laws more effective. When I was, uh, every 10 years, the legislature asked the judiciary to chair a, a review of the penal code. And first Chief Justice Moon asked me because to chair it. It's 29 members, right? All the prosecutors, defense counsel, OHA, uh, the victims' rights group. You know, it's, it's a herding cats operation, right? But he asked me to do it in 2005. And then Chief Justice Recknell asked me to do it in 2015. We came up with 84 recommendations in 15, and two of them got rid of mandatory minimums for drug cases because we realized by this time that sending somebody to Halava prison, no, requiring a judge to send somebody to Halava prison for possession of a small amount of drugs after a couple of convictions it does not make any sense. Again, research shows treatment for drug use is more effective in the community than it is behind bars because it's too too artificial an environment it, behind bars so well, i'm you a would, big you believer would. in policy and being part of that legislators want to ask you questions they want to know if we support this bill that will increase funding for substance abuse are you going to say we're soft on crime <laughs> and i certainly won't i mean that's part of the solution and and understand this i say this as the toughest sentencer in circuit court. I was the first career prosecutor to be appointed to circuit court in Honolulu ever. So I sent more people to prison. I sent more consecutive sentences, but that was the really violent, dangerous ones. 
And that's probably 35% of defendants at sentencing, but they should go to prison. That means the other 65% can and should be placed on probation. And we have successful initiatives like drug court, mental health court, hope probation, that can help people succeed. And when they succeed, that's good. That is good public safety policy too. You were involved in setting up, what was it, the drug court here in, uh, in hope the first probation. circuit? Say it again. Hope probation. Can you talk about it? Yeah, well, on regular probation, the probation officers maybe have 150 clients each, hard to supervise. And if they wanted to bring them back to court, it was for a revocation of probation and to get the underlying five or 10 year prison sentence. And we have good POs, they're all uh, social workers from UH, they care about their clients, but the sanctions part was screwed up because no good PO should want to send somebody to prison, you know, for five years for a couple of dirty urine tests. So I thought to myself, how did we raise our kid? How were we raised? And my guess is if you did something wrong as a kid, your parents did something about it immediately. And that's how you tied together bad behavior with a consequence. So something, I mean, that's simply, simply the idea. So if somebody shows up, tests positive for drugs, these are instant tests. If they admit it, they get arrested on the spot. They go to the jail. We have a hearing two, day, two business days later. And I let them out because they screwed up by using but then they didn't come in and lie about it or worse yet, run away. We're trying to do something very difficult here. We're trying to change people's thinking to change their behavior. If they test positive and deny it, it's possible it's a false positive. We send it to a lab for a gas chromatograph test. But if it comes back, they get 15 days in jail if it's positive. And we'll let them do it on five weekends if they're working. But again, we don't want them to lie about it. We don't want them to be in denial. If they run away and law enforcement has to look for them, it's 30 days in jail. And if that happens repeatedly, they go to Halava. The, 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 mo the greatest thing about hope is how well it works. We, we had a randomized control trial study by Pepperdine and UCLA. Our state attorney general's office looked at it first and the results were great. But you know, you know the line in court, an expert witness is a guy from out of town with a briefcase, right? So when Pepperdine and UCLA came, uh, they did a randomized control trial study, 500 defendants, two thirds in hope, one third in probation as usual. And a year later, the people in hope got arrested for new crimes, 55% less often than the control group on regular probation. And they got sent to prison for 48% fewer days. In criminal justice, a 10% reduction in recidivism is cause for celebration, 50%, unbelievable. 33 states are doing versions of this. Unfortunately, as you know, trying to implement or replicate an idea from one place to another is extremely difficult. So some places are doing it well, getting good outcomes. Washington State is the best example. Some places have screwed this up, have only focused on the sanctions part without the other two legs of it, the probation officers and the judges. But the results have been wonderful. But it strikes me that uh, this, you know, you talked about collaboration among various law enforcement uh, agencies uh, yeah. in a kind of team, a team arrangement. Uh, probation officers, probation officers are, mm, they're part of the civil service. Uh, yeah. They may or may not be effective human beings, I'm sorry to say. Uh, they, may, they may meet your expectations and do the job and implement a program like this well, or maybe yeah. some of them don't. How do you make sure that the, the probation officers that are responsible for implementing a program like this uh, are the right ones? Well, part of it is leadership in the probation department. So the first uh, unit we started with was the high risk unit. Any sex offender not sent to prison, put on probation uh, is in that unit. And also people that are failing at probation on regular probation and maybe getting a revocation to go to prison, they get transferred to that unit. And so Shirley Noy was head of it. She's smart, she's organized, she's kind of a hard ass. And she, she told the POs, you know, you're gonna lose some discretion at the front end. You've got to violate them every single time when they do this. That's how it's gonna have credibility. And that's how it started. And it was just one judge at the beginning. So I was very consistent because my whole view of discretion has changed through this process. Because it, for a defendant, if he and his friend both smoke meth, and go into the office and are both testing positive, if they're not treated the same way, they think that is unfair. That's arbitrary. The PO is prejudiced. 
you know, one may not agree. Oh, it's my 10th time. And the other, it's only a second time. But that's the, that's, you know, so what we did in hope is the sanctions are required. The POs do not have discretion on that anymore. And I was very consistent as a judge, two days for a dirty test you admit to, 15 if you deny confirmed, 30 if you run away. Sure, it goes the the same way as uh, teaching your kids, follow the rules. Exactly. The sanctions sanctions are known in advance. But this suggests uh, maybe sentencing guidelines on on you know certain sentences for certain crimes and certain yeah. repetitions do we have that do you support that well that's that's why when i was chairing the penal code review committee we got rid of the mandatory minimums exactly what you said we had what was called a methamphetamine trafficking case you know i mean statute because this started when meth exploded on the scene here people were scared uh, that meth was you know going to tear our entire society apart and it's done a lot of damage no question but what was required was if you sell any amount of meth and the, the case, because we had all these defense attorneys and prosecutors and judges, there were seven judges on this as well, including five of them were former prosecutors. The only cases we'd see in state court were a guy selling, usually a guy, a $20 bag of meth to an undercover police officer because a, a business owner saw a guy selling in front of his property and called HPD and said, can you get rid of this guy? Well, that kind of case, we would have to give the guy a 10-year prison term. No exceptions, because he was selling meth. Oh, you'd month. be in favor of giving the judge more discretion. Right. And so okay. what we did was we put meth with the other drugs. And so the judge can either give him the 10 years in prison for selling drugs or put him on probation. And same thing with possession of a small amount of drugs. In the past, he was part of repeat offender. Many people had to go to prison. Now we made it probationable. So just in the last few years, hundreds of people have been given a chance on probation. And I can tell you, anybody selling a $20 bag of meth, almost by definition, is a user who's selling some to feed his own habit. A couple of other things, Steve. Uh, One is, you know, with all of this, uh, with the policy and the management and uh, the the public uh, issues, um, do you see yourself actually prosecuting cases? I remember Peter Carlisle, I'm familiar with that. Um, did not prosecute cases generally, um, but when they had the uh, the Xerox murders, if you remember, yeah. um, back when you know this, this disgruntled employee went and shot up the place, yeah. uh, he prosecuted that because it was high level. I, I guess he thought it was good for the job. Uh, what about you? Do, you? do you see yourself prosecuting cases as the prosecutor? I don't see myself doing that. You know, I've done a lot of that. I did five murder cases when I was at the prosecutors. As a judge, I presided at over two hundred you know, making sure there was no prosecutorial misconduct. So I will be actively involved with training the deputies. But that's like the police chief does not go and investigate the burglary. I mean, I'm sure she could do a good job at it or chase somebody down the street, but she should be meeting with the Honolulu prosecutor. She should be talking to the troops. She should be meeting with the head of the FBI. You know, and doing trials is fun. We have great, you know, you really enjoy it. It's all consuming. But I have to say, the tendency is going to be, it, it's going to have outsized importance whether you win or lose, too. So you tend to pick cases you know you're going to win. Mm-hmm. And in that case, there are a lot of other deputy prosecutors who should be able to do those cases. I am going to be so busy trying to get Weed and Seed started in Chinatown and Kalihi, meeting with Chief Ballard, meeting with Mark Rechtenwald, who I used to work with. You know, he's the chief justice at the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, there's, there's so many parts of the job. It would be fun to do trials again, but I just, you know, I just don't see that there's so much else that needs to be done. Yeah. And and as I was telling you before, before the, uh, you know, the, the show began, I mean, I think you're going to have more work, um, depending on who's elected president, um, and, uh, and how we do on COVID, um, you're going to have more domestic violence and all that, which the prosecutor will have to deal with that. But let me ask you this, you so you, you're going to run off with Megan Cap. That's the way it is. And I, I would yeah. like to ask you, what, what's the difference? And don't tell me it's a gender difference. Well, <laughs> what's the difference between you and your opposing candidate? Well, I, th- I think uh, a lot of it is I have a proven record of leadership. I was a, a team captain, a division head. I ran the U.S. Attorney's Office. As a judge, I saw the entire system. I wasn't an advocate on one side or the other. I saw the whole system. So... I have led a team of prosecutors and 
uh, I, no offense, I don't think Ms. Cow has ever supervised anybody. So the learning curve of how to learn how to be a supervisor, let alone discovering whether you can be an effective leader or not, is something people don't have to worry about with me. They know I've been an effective leader. I've led other prosecutors. And with programs like Weed and Seed, we have actually reduced crime. And people would love to see that again. And it expanded from Kalihi and Chinatown to the Ala Moana area, and it should go to other communities after that. It's a good strategy of new law enforcement, a different way of doing things. I'm going to be open to any new innovative ideas, but I'm also going to try to do stuff that has been proven to work. So I think that's the biggest. And I think the results of the primary show that they, to bring trust back to that office, you need proven leadership. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I offer that. And I, and I can do that. I'm committed to it. I have a lot of energy. I'll bring in good supervisors with me and we will get the job done. All right. Uh, we have a question. Let me take a moment. Oh, wow. It's a, it's a long question. Uh, I'll try to make it short uh, from a viewer. So work in the, uh, I work in the community and I have heard exactly what you said about locals feeling crime is worse now than ever. One client witnessed a police officer letting a mugger go in Waikiki last year. He said the reason was he didn't want to be tied up in court if he arrested him. How do you propose to change the outlook where an officer is deferred from making an arrest because of potential negative consequences? There's an interesting question. Uh, So (laughs) what do you say to that viewer, Steve? Well, I... I would say uh, if the guy was a mugger and had actually committed a crime, that officer should be fired. You know, and I, I have been training the officers at the police academy for 20 years about what, depending on what my job was, I go and talk about that. Well, this will be a part of it too. Uh, and I think what the police have done to their credit during this COVID crisis is when it's appropriate, issue citations instead of making an arrest. Or if they can defer an arrest, if it's not going to threaten public safety, then, that's, then they do that. And so they have slowed the intake of prisoners into OCCC. And I think that's been part of the success about why they were able to reduce the numbers in there. Uh, but if somebody you know, has committed a violent crime, there is no excuse for them not getting arrested. So I don't understand that. I think Chief Ballard would join me. Uh, I think Shopo would join me that an officer like that, if that was actually happening, should not be on the force uh, and, you know, should be disciplined immediately. Okay, Steve, um, uh, so nice to talk to you. There are many, many other questions. I wish we had more time. Uh, Good luck on the balance of the campaign. uh, And uh, we'll talk to you soon, one way or the other. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Stay safe.